which is um, a PF, just for PFLA members. Um, and like last time, we're hoping that we can have a really good discussion at the end of the presentations tonight. So uh, just to quickly introduce myself, for those of you who don't know, I'm chair of the PFLA. Um, we farm near Seven Oaks in Kent. And I actually thought I'd kick this off following a conversation with Jimmy yesterday with just a few um, photos from home. Um, it gives a background to the topic tonight, which is bale grazing. I think for many of us, bale grazing, especially if you haven't done it before, is one of the biggest challenges. Uh, Jimmy, I can see that Dave has joined. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's one of the biggest challenges to get into, to be um, he um, putting your cattle across wet fields all winter and giving them hay out there. Um, but I think it's also possibly at the heart of um, what m many of us want to achieve. So I thought tonight we are going to be talking from three complete experts on it who've got it all sussed to know how to do it. But I would um, kick off by just telling you where we're at at home because I sort of feel I've got more questions than answers. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, here we go. Can you all see that? Yep. Yep. Um, so what we've been doing at home, we farm over in Kent. We've got um, a herd of um, Herefords, around about 22 suckler cows um, and 150 clean ewes. Um, we've been experimenting with what I'd call bale grazing rather loosely for the last three years. Here we are trying to, this little paddock here, it's only one hectare. We totally trashed over the years by having laminitic horses on it. So they, the grass was kept really short. And when you dig down, you can literally see a top turf of really short grasses and then there's nothing much going on underneath. So for the last couple of years, we've done exactly what you can see in this photograph here. We've actually used electric fencing. So we've put a back fence up. We make these massive Heston bales, take them out to the field, spread them out, um, get the cows to eat them, and then move them across the field over a period of three or four weeks. There's a few problems with it. Um, Heston bales are hard work to get out and spread across the field. Uh, especially you've got, not got a great back. Um, the field gets wet. We haven't been, we, we discovered in the first year that if you set the pest and bales out beforehand, the water does go into them and they get quite yucky by the end of the period. So clearly we need to move over to round bales. Um, and then both years we've been faced with the most incredibly dry spring and hot weathers. And I'd say that there's been very little biological activity going on in this field. So it doesn't feel like we've made any headway at all in improving what's going on underneath the soil by doing this process across these, uh, this particular field. We're not giving up and just hoping that we might get a nice wet spring to start getting all of that um, biologically activity going. But it's, I just raised this really because it shows to me some of the things that other members who haven't really yet quite got it like I have um, are perhaps um, fighting with and toying with over the years. Um, this year, um, we've also, we're lucky enough, um, we have a piece of um, highland, so we're basically clay, but we've got some green sand ridge. And every single year we um, outwinter all of our young stock on this ridge. It's nice and dry. We feed hay up there and we, we it's basically a 25 acre block. We just do it all in one go. Um, again, influenced by the whole mob grazing influence. Um, I feel that we should be mob grazing up there and not um, letting them graze over the whole lot. So that's been quite a challenge in itself, um, not least just getting water up to the mob because we have a well for the farm and that's as high as I can get water. So I've just got water up. I literally took this photograph this afternoon when I went up to see some of the, um, the um, stock that's up there. Um, getting the fencing up there again, is, is a big business but for those of you who might be interested we've actually we're we're going into high tier stewardship and I think you can do this in mid tier too there's a payment FG4 which is um, a meterage payment 
especially for installing permanent electric fencing and fencing off areas that you might want to leave for wildlife. So we've actually on this paddock here, you can see us going up the hill, installed this electric fencing, fenced off on the right hand side, an area that I think is really exciting. It's going to be really scrubby and good. And it now means we've got the infrastructure of electric fencing up there. So I'm hoping that over the years we can start to mob graze it in the winter. Um, these are our cattle a few weeks ago before it got too wet and again they're in a small cell which you can't see. Um, there they are eating their hay uh, but again it's just been taken up on a Heston bale. Driving in across a wet field with a heavy bale is not great and after the downpours we had a week or so ago they have now come off that piece of land. But it's been us just dipping our toe in the water and trying to work out how we can learn from all the amazing learning that goes on on the PFLA um, forum, picking up on tips from people, uh, watching webinars like the one last night with um, done by groundswell and just l learning how we can improve things on our farm uh, we're by no means there at all and I hope that tonight we're going to have presentations from three PFLA members all of whom who can really um, show us how to do it so I'm going to stop showing my screen and we're going to start off our three speakers tonight are Humphrey Wells who's manager of FII farms in Oxfordshire Simon Cutter, who farms over in Herefordshire, and David Cornforth, who's on the Kent Sussex border. David, in particular, has got some great kit that I thought we might um, just have a closer look at tonight. He was also on the last mob grazing um, webinar a couple of weeks ago. So we do want this to be a discussion at the end. Um, hopefully the presentations will be over in 40 minutes, allowing for plenty of discussion and questions and points raised. So, Humphrey, are you there? I can't actually see you amongst all these people, but... Um, yeah, I'm here. Oh, great. Okay, I'm going to hand over to you uh, to kick the session off. Brill, thank you. Right, just let me know if you've got my presentation up now. Yep, that looks good. Perfect. Cool. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining. So, yeah, my name is Humphrey Wells and I'm the farm supervisor here at FAI Farms in Oxford. Uh, we're a 1,200 acre organic farm, two miles from the centre of Oxford, right on the outskirts. Um, we've been organic for 15 years now. We run a spring carving suckle herd of Solaires, Aberdeen Angus and Stabiliser cattle, a spring lambing flock of Clin and Aberfield sheep. We are 100% grass fed, have been with the cattle for three years now and the sheep now for 12 months. Um, we've been holistic plan grazing for 12 months now. We've got some free range hens, um, a couple hundred acres of arable and we've been transitioning towards regenerative agriculture this year, uh, focusing on soil, uh, protecting the soil, uh, trying not to till at all. We are min tilling in the arable, but looking to trial some pasture cropping from next year. We also have a consultancy business uh, made up of about 24 consultants. Um, within that, we've got veterinarians, scientists, supply, supply chain experts, animal welfare experts, and we work with um, big retail brands um, and try and encourage them to use uh, or source more sustainable food and try and educate them and use the farm, although we run it as a commercial farm, we use it to showcase what we feel is best practice um, and show them why 100% grass fed is the best, um, best choice to be making. So we do quite a lot of R&D on the farm here as well. Um, we grow quite a lot of herbal lays within the arable rotations. So we've got 19 hectares of lucerne and 16 hectares of herbal lays. Um, we've, we take a multi-cut silage uh, system um, uh, to cut for winter forage and then from about the 1st of August we wean our lambs onto the herbal lays and mob graze them through to finish. This year we, the top right is a picture of a herbal lay I put in on the 3rd of May, I meant to put it in last autumn but as I'm sure we're all aware it was pretty wet and I, I missed the window. I put it in on the 3rd of May and it didn't rain for eight weeks. And I thought I'd completely screwed up. 
Um, our agronomist Br Stephen Briggs said, young man, patience, just got to be patient. And the rain did come. Um, I topped the annual weeds out at the end of July. And that's a picture of it mid-August where we'd had some rain and I put some fattening cattle in and it's come good, but it, it took a long time to get there. Um, haymaking. So we, we're really fortunate that we've got quite a lot of um, uh, hay meadows. The River Thames goes right through our farm and a half of the farm can be underwater at one point. It even flooded in the summer of 2007. Um, a lot of those hay meadows are in triple SI. So as many of you know, we can't do anything with them until the 16th of July when we can take a cut of hay. Um, but yeah, we really value that diversity um, and the species, species rich hay that we take. We uh, round bale um, and use that in our bale grazing situation. So creating paddocks. We've been using AgriWeb now for probably, I'm going to say nine months um, and getting on really well with it now. So that's the farm mapped out. Um, and using AgriWeb, we, uh, in our outwintering ground, which is up here in uh, an old parkland, we map out uh, 0.5 hectare paddocks. Um, and we do this in August so that when we're carting the round bales out, um, we know where our electric fences are going to be that winter. So just by clipping my smartphone to the dashboard of the JCB, when I'm putting those bales out, I know when I come to put my electric fence up in the winter, there'll be three bales within each pod. So um, tools for the job for outwintering. I spent, um, I'll just go back a little bit. So I saw outwintering in New Zealand when I was farming out there a few years ago. It's quite common practice. Um, and it wasn't until I came back to the UK and I thought about being able to do it here. Um, but when I met Rob Havard, who many of you will be aware of, uh, absolutely phenomenal guy. Um, Rob kindly took me around his farm probably four years ago now and showed me his outwintering system, which um, you know I very much copied in many ways. Um, using that diverse species rich hay, we're rolling out so all that latent seed within it is spreading and hopefully this pretty degraded parkland um, will become a species rich pasture over time. It's important to say this parkland was a uh, forest until the 1840s when the Duke of Abingdon cut it all down because in the uh, era of Capability Brown, I believe it was quite trendy to have a, a wood pasture. So it was wood pasture for the uh, quite a long time following. And then the previous tenant to FAI plowed it all up and grew maize for an intensive dairy, um, wrecking a lot of the soil structure, killing 60% uh, of the trees within it. Um, and if you talk to the locals that were here at the time, they could hear them plowing through and ripping through the old oak roots. Um, uh, and yeah, it was pretty, pretty detrimental to the ground. So the point I'm making is, although it's been pasture for sort of 12 years now, the soil structure is really quite poor. It's very heavy clay. Um, uh, water percolation is really, really poor. Um, but the key is to get those covers as high as possible, shut that ground up as high, uh, long as possible beforehand to um, protect that soil from poaching. So tools for the job, electric fencing and posts. We use um, uh, Kiwi Tech posts, which I'll argue to the ground are the best thing on the market. You can see here in the middle, you're able to uh, end your reel um, with three posts and that's super sturdy. Um, the quad bike at the bottom there, we've got the reel just fabricated up a simple bracket to the front. So you can drive along, put your posts out as you go clip it at the end and you can quite easily do 300 meters in under three minutes doing that system. So it's all about time. Um, up at the top right, you can see we built um, a skid trough last winter. We, we sort of trialed it last winter. I persuaded my boss that I thought it was doable. So um, we put some bales out in a couple fields and we outwinted 40 dry cows just to see how the, the ground reacted, how it stood up to the elements and the management um, it was, I think, officially the wettest winter on record, certainly the wettest I can remember. It started raining the end of August last year and it didn't really stop until the spring. Um, so we just 
we did we invested in a few extra electric fencing posts but we didn't do anything to the water infrastructure and as you can see at the bottom right we did suffer with frozen water pipes which was definitely definitely our shortcoming um, but we made it through um, tools for the job also a good set of waterproofs you're going to be out in the rain so after trialing it last year, we realized our main shortfall was water. So we needed to put in ideally a new water system. So that's what we did. This is the Parkland. We uh, took advice from James Daniel at Precision Grazing, who's got a wealth of knowledge in installing these systems and farm infrastructure. So we put in three and a half kilometers of water pipe, uh, a 10 bar pump in the buildings with a mains water supply. Um, and we spec'd the pump up to run a capacity of 150 suckler cows with calves in the middle of the summer, which is where we should be in a few years. Um, we then bought a cheap mole plow off eBay for a couple hundred quid, fabricated a piece on the back so that we could mole plow a 32 mil pipe. Um, and then on that ring main of pipe, every 150 meters, we've got a hydrant point coming to the surface so that we can um, tap into a hydrant in the, the closest, uh, nice and close to the cell. So therefore limiting the amount of overground pipe we have. So just doing a quick cost comparison, because um, the numbers are really crucial. And here is a um, table I've borrowed or stolen from the AHDB website, which they did in July this year. And it just breaks down very simply the costs of housing cattle. So they've got £2.40 per day for a 600 kilo suckler cow. As um, we were discussing briefly yesterday, Simon was saying, I think that's going to be um, quite a bit higher this year with the price of fodder and straw, which I definitely agree with. Our system is around about the 80p a day mark. So if we just quickly go through the numbers, 80 cows, £2.40 a day, that's £192 a day for 150 days in the shed, that's 28 grand. Out wintering, you know, 80 cows, 80p a day, that's 64 pound a day. It's a total of 9,600. So that's a saving of almost 20 grand in one winter. From keeping cows outside, our cows are keep it, keeping their condition, they almost look better. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's really a no brainer from the numbers point of view. Um, just there again, briefly, the breakdown cost of the, of the water system, three and a half kilometers of water pipe, 10 bar pump, some fittings, and quite a lot of fittings, cheap mole plow off eBay and labor. We put that in ourselves at a cost of 10 grand. We were fortunate that we had um, some parts about the farm. I was able to um, fabricate some tanks to hold the water. So we've got 10,000 litre tank inside the shed from the mains. So therefore, if the mains did get shut off, for whatever reason, we're, the cows are not gonna run out of water for at least 36 hours. So that is a cost that we were able to avoid. But yeah, that's 120 pounds per hectare. Um, and going on the saving that we've made, that's a return on investment in the first winter. You could look at it that way. That's also going to um, increase our efficiency um, and um, utilization of grazing within the growing season. We, we, gra we do close this uh, ground up from the beginning of August when we put the hay up and then we won't graze the majority of it until we put the cows out, depending on the season. This year was a bit earlier because um, the rest of the farm got pretty wet. So they were in there from October, but that might be the end of November, depending on the season. But we shut it up then so that we've got sufficient growth to maximise the covers going into winter. And that is the crucial part, because the more biomass you can have above ground, the more thatching, the more it's going to hold the cows up and not poach the surface of the soil. Obviously, as we know, the more biomass above ground, the more biomass below ground in the root zone. So it's going to hold the soil structures together. It's going to help percolate water away. Um, and yeah, ultimately be able to keep the cattle out. So yeah, a few sort of closing notes, I think. Um, I think we talked about it last night, but I think you, you're the expert on your own farm. You know which fields aren't going to be suitable, you know, ideally higher ground, 
Um, soil type I don't think is that relevant because I think most of us on this talk are on heavy clay. A lot of people say, oh, you can never do that on this farm. Well, when I came to FAI, everyone said you couldn't do this on this farm. Um, and yet we are doing it now um, with not a lot of intervention. Um, so, but the, the key is finding a suitable spot, maximizing your covers for entry, sorting out your water, because water is key. And as we know, cattle are thirsty and sorting out frozen water pipes in the middle of January isn't much fun and it takes a lot of your time. But so experiment, you know, try it on a small scale to build the confidence within yourself, if anything, uh, but always have a plan B and a plan C. You know, so in the cold, if, you know, the beast of the east comes in, we move our cows to sort of a bale pod system where we know we've got some permanent troughs that are definitely not going to freeze, even with the harshest winter, and they've got plenty of feed. And the plan C is have a shed to bring them in if there is a disaster. But I think the key from experience is go and visit someone. It's winter now. I know there's COVID about, but hopefully in the new year, we might be able to get out to farms and visit. For me, it was uh, visiting Rob Havard. That really gave me the confidence that it could be done. Um, and then and then trial and yeah, see what feedback your land gives you. But it, I think it is a tool that can be used on every farm. It might be that you can't keep them out all winter, but you might be able to keep them out for two months longer. So there's massive savings in that alone. So yeah, give it a try, I think. Uh, this, I think this is the final slide. So this on the right was a couple of days ago. That's me rolling out a bale of our triple SI hay into the park. And on the left, that's the same park that we were grazing at the end of July. And yeah, hopefully, I, that I'll be completely honest, that's a slightly biased shot, but that's what I'm hoping the whole of the park will look like, you know, in 10 years time from rolling out those bales, that diversity would have spread and we'll have a beautiful, diverse wood pasture cool i think that's me done that's absolutely brilliant humphrey thank you very much um really professionally shown and everything um we'll have mainly have discussion at the end but there's two very specific questions humphrey which i just wanted to ask you now yeah. uh which have come up on the chat i know you said you experimented with 40 cattle and you're aiming for 150 what number of cattle are you actually at now and what sort of weight are your cattle yeah, so um, our cows were originally um, pedigree Solaire, but we've had Angus bulls for quite a few years moving towards stabiliser genetics. So our cows are still uh, too bigger than I would like. So average mature weight is uh, 680 kilograms. I want to get that down to around the 600, 620 mark. Um, and in terms of numbers, we'll be carving down 85 cows in the spring. So at the moment, we're, we're outwintering 75 cows and calves and we'll wean the calves off in the second week of January. Great, thank you. Okay, we're going to move over to Simon Cutter now. So Simon, if you'd like to introduce yourself, say a little bit more about, you know, where you farm and everything else, um, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. So um, I farm in Herefordshire probably about 700 acres, um, but we have one particular block of um, 550 acres that was in countryside stewardship and then in higher level stewardship. Um, has no buildings and I started off 20 years ago wintering the cows on a bark corral, which was sort of in vogue at the time. And then suddenly I went to my uh, English nature um, guy and said, I want to do some outwintering. So the rules were specifically against outwintering because they didn't want um, us all to cover the place with Welsh tax sheep for big money. So anyway, he gave me a derogation to start feeding out um, the cows over the winter. So we we have 100 Hereford cows, um, half autumn calving, and those calves stay out with their mothers all winter and half spring calving, like Humphrey, we'll wean those second or third week in January. And we've now outwintered those on this piece of land for 18 years running. And um, we always try and ask people to see if they can see the mess. We're on heavy clay. Um, 
really nasty, sticky soil. And yet, walking around the estate, you won't you won't see any severe damage or poaching. You couldn't tell where I'd fed um, fed these bales. So I started. I started the first. I started carrying the bales out on the tractor, and um, I, I soon found I was making more damage with the vehicles than the cows, quite substantially more. So I started then placing after we um, made the hay all round bales and hopefully um, hard centered round bales. I started placing them in strategic points around the, um, around the farm and um, moving the cows to them with simple electric fence. So I'm very, very low tech. I have a pen knife and a dog and a stick. And um, certainly last winter I had to walk around because even the, um, you know, even the, the quad bikes were making a mess. So, um, yeah, so Jimmy's got some photos, has he? Or... Anyway, I've got some photos um, somewhere. We've, we've even got bales yeah. this year from, um, um, that we didn't use last year. So those fields have been totally ungrazed. Yeah, well, so the photo on the left, this is, shows how muddy we get. So this is this, is this season where a tractor's gone through the, um, through the gateway. And you can see how muddy and sticky it's gone already. And the photo on the right is just uh, where there's a salt lick. And, um, you know, in two or three days, the cows have totally trashed that, that ground. And last winter, it got so wet that the bales were aquaplaning. They weren't even gripping on the soil for me to roll them out. And you could just push them along on the mud. And yet, um, we've got some further pictures that will show you um what how it's um gone on um what's interesting is so both both of those fields the green bit was was up to their hocks in mud this spring and um so one was just a, a permanent pasture on the left and just beyond the permanent pasture is the field that didn't actually get grazed last year and then and the bales are still sitting out there and we'll start feeding those soon behind a fence and on the right you can see where it where the where it was absolutely trashed and poached the main um plant to come back with the plantains so it's so there's one heck of a lot where every bale was there's just a heap of plantains and then the grass will come back and it'll mend but the key to it all is if i you can see the bales in the background ready they're in pairs where I can move the um, electric fence between them. But if I'd got the bales where we trashed last year, I would start to start making terrible damage. So the key is if you make a damage for a year, it'll mend itself and um, be as green as green. But if you go back to the same place another year running, you will do serious damage and it will take much longer to come back. So as Humphrey says, I, I'm around ATP um, a cow per day for the winter. And also the time it takes me, it takes me longer to drive to the fields than it takes about 20 minutes for each lot of cows to, um, to feed them. So like 40 minutes a day, I can't see anybody um, with the most mechanisation in the world doing it for that sort of, um, that sort of time. And then you get a good look at all the cows, you check that they come and feed. And um, back in the early days of English nature, they didn't believe that the, the, the grass seeds could be um, transferred through the sows, through the cows' stomachs. And then we started seeing little, little circles of birds with trefoil appearing where bales had been, you know, in preceding years. And suddenly they realized it was a good thing. And now you know, when we went into HLS, they were happy for us just to um, outwinter generally. And the bird life was quite incredible. And the wildlife in, in, those, in the bales that have been out, there would be voles living underneath them. And the voles wouldn't be there unless there were lots of little insects and worms and things for them to live on. And there are hundreds of voles. And the other interesting thing is that um, we've got wagtail groupies now with each bunch of cows. And the wagtails will hear my hear my truck before the cows, and they'll be waiting 
and there's probably 18 or 20 wagtails with each group of cows now. And so when the um, English nature people saw the benefits with nature as well as well as everything, you know, they were they were sort of sold on this. We were increasing our wildflowers, we were increasing nature, biodiversity, and everything, and doing things in a much more natural um, natural uh, way. Um, the only time the cows break the fence is to get at shelter, and I think I think there's possibilities with agroforestry to build. If you planted a little square of woodland in the middle of your field and radiated out your cells. You'd have the shelter in the middle, and um, you could then bale feed in the segments. Because they will, they, they'll never break the, the fence to get at more hay, but it, if they suddenly need a place to shelter from a certain wind, they will just go for it. And I've sort of learned that now. So, you, you know, we'll feed these bales from this end because I know if I fed them the other way and the wind came wrong, they would um, all head up towards us. So, like Humphrey says, it's an absolute no-brainer. There's, there's so much work and research done on grazing, the normal summer grazing thing, and all the costs about wintering of um, wintering cattle are ignored. And I, I think people, you know, are going to be up to four pounds a day um, this year on on straw and and whatever. And if they, with some forethought and some planning, and, and like Humphrey says, it's getting those covers. From July, from haymaking time, those those are your wintering fields. You mustn't be tempted anywhere else to, to get on them. You need that that pad of grass to um, to protect the soil from the cattle, to feed the cattle, and to look after the wildlife. So, yeah, it's well, I just wouldn't do anything else now. I just couldn't see um, the cows. The cows are healthier. Um, because they, they will lose some condition. Uh, we have Hereford cows that are probably 620 kilos um, a live weight. And um, of course, the shape of the hoof and the amount of bone they've got also is important to the weight on the pasture. But you, you build up this, this carpet. And, and you say after the last grazing in sort of February, March, that grass will be the first to come back to start on the summer grazing. Amazing how that carpet, you know, if you don't, um, of course, last year was exceptional trashing it. Normally, you know, they would just have a slice of green and um, it would stay green and would come back and um, be ready for summer grazing really quickly. So it is amazing. Uh, I think these Herefords, you know, in Herefordshire, it, it is a scene from, you know, hundreds of years ago, except for the round bales. They probably would have made little patches of, patches of grass and um, to feed the cattle out, but you know they would have been fed out in this sort of way. I think that's all I probably need to say, but um, I don't know how any, anybody can ignore 30 or 40,000 pounds worth of cost. Great, Simon, thank you very much indeed. That's um, really interesting. Um, we'll move straight on to David and, um, David sent me through some um, vid videos he did uh, this morning out in his field. So I think, David, if it works for you, I'm just going to whiz through your videos to show it, them to everybody. And then um, you can add anything at the end. Does that work for you? Yeah. OK, so um, here we go. Let me share my screen. Okay, so I hope we, you can all hear this because it's got David talking in it as well. Hold on.
I added in these two photographs which David sent through to me because I think that's quite an interesting discussion point about the ground that presumably you just left, David. Um, here is a photograph with a lot of stuff that's left, including a load of cow saliva. So David's really into his cow saliva. You might like to talk about that, David. And then finally, from David, I thought it would be interesting for us all to see this um, piece of kit he uses um, to move um, round bales around. And that's made up very simply from a diagram here, which is the final slide for David, uh, just showing how he made that together from, um, I think this was from Greg Judy. So David, those are your slides. Do you want to add anything to that? I'll stop showing my screen. You're on mute, David, at the moment. David, you need to unmute yourself. Hello, is that, that better? That's better, yeah, that's it. We can hear you, yep. Technical miss up there. Yes, uh, the reason I uh, use this in rural is because I no longer look at the cows. I don't really look at the cows as long as the room is full. I'm looking at the ground. And when, you, when you've got a long return time before coming back to grazing, which is anywhere from 60 to 100 days, 100 plus days, you notice some of the grass doesn't grow as well. And the more you go down this route, the more you notice certain soils are not performing. So I target the poor, the poor grass, and that's where I put the hay. Primarily to get more animal impacts and possibly get some hay left over try and feed the biology and sort of kickstart that ground. Because what I've noticed since I've gone down this system is the good ground gets better faster than the poor ground. And it doesn't seem to matter how much you put on the poor ground, it never seems to catch up with the good ground. <laughs> seems a bit bizarre, really. But uh, that's my thinking behind everything. Um, I'm quite heavily stocked, so I, I still have to house. And uh, I think there's a sweet spot there between how many animals you've grown and the acres you have. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a pretty small farm. I only have 120 acres. But cow numbers and cattle numbers vary from 140. And this year it's back down to 90 with the dry summer because of, because of the um, low silage stocks. So I'm concentrating on keeping them out even longer and, uh, and trying to reduce that. that that housing period. And one of the reasons, one of the things I'm doing is I bought a little old PTO wood chipper and we're chipping wood. So when I do have to house, we can uh, use that as bedding. And some of the very expensive straw I've bought, which can, I can probably put it through the cows rather than put it on the floor. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I would agree with everything Simon and Humphrey have said. That, Absolutely everything. It's a complete, complete uh, no-brainer trying to house housing cows for six months of the year. Um, yeah, that's all I'm going to say. Really. Yeah. All I would say is the cells that Humphreys put in. That's good, but sometimes when when the weather's inclement, you've got to give them more, or you can give them less, or you, you need to feed more bills. Like last last Friday, we had a severe weather event down in Kent. We had, uh, I think we had 50 mil in 24 hours. And my hay consumption went up from one bill to three bills. And the area that the sellers were in doubled for those two days. So you've got to be completely flexible. You mustn't tie yourself into having a set area and a set bill because the weather can throw all sorts of things at you. Um, yeah, that's, 
I, I do use the back latch, the back latch, I don't know whether you saw that, we move them, because sometimes I work off farm as well, so if I'm not around, I, I know I'm not going to be around, I'll move them, and the, the back latch will go off and let them into the next sector, and I come back at night and check them. Also in summer when I'm grazing very long covers, and I want to get maximum impact, like something like a million pounds per acre, and that, that is cows virtually touching themselves or not touching an electric fence. You get vegetation smacked into the ground, but keeping animal intakes, not, not compromising on animal performance, which means you've got to keep them in tight and move them probably four or five, six times a day. It's not for everyone that, but it's the only way I can see that I can keep making money this place on a limited acreage is to push the cow numbers up, build soil fertility, and, and look to not rely on subsidy anymore. David, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. So that's been three really different presentations. I hope it's um, uh, raised a lot of questions in your mind or points that you'd like to make. So if anybody would like to ask a question, please just unmute yourself and call out. I can't see you all on my screen. Um, or you can put it in the chat. Hello. Hi, Victoria. Hi. Um, does anybody put into the mix a measure of the um, compaction on, in their soil or water filter, filtration? We've got fields which are well sodden already with um, water on a clay valley. And I'm worried that it's to do with compaction and how do I combat that um, having taken over the farm in the last 18 months um, and Rest. trying to practice what you preach, guys. <laughs> Rest. I'm, I'm grazing a cover crop now and they can only be on it for uh, two or three hours. So I, I just move them, move them on and you rest it. And I've, I've got some very wet land. I mean, we had a farm walk last week and uh, luckily it was on the Wednesday, on the Friday, it was underwater. You've got to rest the ground, you know, you must rest it. Ground, ground will stand a really harsh beating, but you've got to then let it recover. Even if in a severe case, you might have to leave it a year. Yeah, I just echo what David said there and what Simon touched on. I think by doing this, you really value um, permanent pastures ability to recover if given the opportunity. And, you know, you don't get it right every day. And I, I haven't got pictures in the slide, but, you know, we had a severe weather event. It had a lot of rain. There were, It was a weekend I was away. They were given slightly too small a cell and it looked pretty muddy and chewed up, but actually it was superficial move away and if you look at that same paddock a week 10 days later it's actually greened up and it's not like they've got 10 inch poach holes in it's only the top few inches but we'll make sure that we give that an extra rest and by the spring as simon said you won't notice it but permanent pasture a thick sward it's amazing when you're keep moving animals regularly what it can withstand I wanted to ask you guys, all of you really, if you leave a pasture quite poached, so one of the photographs that David showed, it was, I mean, I accept it was only a few inches. Do you use the roller at all afterwards? Do you feel you need to go in in the spring and roll it all out? I suppose you were trying to make hay or something out of that field. I did last year, I must admit, tried to get around the severe pastures, but not normally, not normally. Simon, do you yeah. roll your fields mm. at all? No, I think, like Humphrey's saying, that the, the cow, the, com the compaction and poaching from cows, say on a on a day, on a you know for a day or two or three days, isn't deep. You know, these this compaction is more likely, you know, caused by um, vehicles. I was doing far far worse damage with the vehicles, and and you know that poaching, it will just you'd be amazed how soon, like Humphrey says you'd be amazed how soon it comes back. I know it looks dreadful on the day and you wonder what on earth you've done, but um, give it a month, it'll be level and, you know, grows and new seeds will grow in it. And um, 
you know, the old boys did used to let the cat cattle, you know, go through the old feggy layer and let new seeds, um, new seeds germinate there and re reinvigorate the lay. But it, it is just a matter of permanent pasture and letting that cover grow from July onwards and, and not getting anywhere near it. And you've got, you know, it'll then take, you know, um, you, you wouldn't, wouldn't want to put great big Charolais cows there. They would, they would wreck it. But, but um, native breed cattle, it'll never go in more than their hooves. I would add to that as well. You keep them full, they don't move. You keep them in a cell, tight in the cell, but keep them full. They'll just stand there and chill the cud. Mm. In my early days, 20 years ago, trying to keep dairy cows outside, the storm would come in, you'd hear them all bellowing and rampaging around the farm. <laughs> you keep them full, they, they've no reason to move. They don't move in a shed in winter, they just stand and chill the cud, don't they? And if you keep that room and full, it keeps them warm. You know, I think the room and operates at about 42 degrees, isn't it? Yeah. But uh, once, you, once you get that, that triangle goes hollow and empty, that's when, you know, you're in trouble. And that's when the cows are uneasy. Yeah, and you've got to keep watching the weather forecast. Exactly. And, you know, work ahead if, if a storm's coming, then fill them right up, you know, and then you know, whilst they're sheltering from the storm, they're not eating anyway. And you, we haven't really talked much about the waste. There is going to be waste of hay everywhere, but that's going back into the soil. It's going to increase your fertility. But, you know, compared to the cost savings, you know, you can afford to have this waste around the place. But look, at the waste, look at the waste you've got in the shed. If you've got cows in the shed, that manure that comes out the back, back end of them, is mixed with straw, and to then use that manure, um, possibly on the pasture, you've got to compost it. And by composting it, you virtually lose half the energy. Uh, I mean, Greg Judy states that a, a cow pat out at grass is worth a dollar. A cow pat in the shed is probably costing a dollar. <laughs> yeah, at least. Shadia, was it you want, somebody's wanted to ask a question? Yes, it was me. Yeah. Um, I just wondered um, about unrolling bales. I mean, in your experience, you, you three, I mean, how important is it? I mean, it rather, you know, instead of just leaving a bale in situ and letting them sort of like have a go at it, I mean, rolling it out, because I haven't got one of those gadgets and I'm not very good. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm not very good at welding. I don't know how to weld. So making one myself isn't an option. Is no, well, I just push mine along. Or should I just say, oh, never mind? No, you'll get far more damage around just leaving a bale in one place, especially if you've got a whole load of cows pushing to get to it. So if you just unroll it, so they can all feed evenly. Nobody's going to get bullied out. But, you know, I just, I just cut the net on the one side and push it along with my hands. You know, that's the good thing about round bales is they will roll. Mm. I'll have to give it a go. Thank you. You do need to balance. Um, if, you've got, if you've got 10 cows, you give them a bale on, on a cell that they're grazing or a, an area, that might be too much. And that's when you will get severe wastage. If you roll it out, they will, they will latch that line on because it's nice and dry. And that's, you will get terrific wastage then. So, so you need to try and balance how much the cows are going to eat in the day or in, in that particular cell. So that, that is a bit of a balancing act. I mean, if you've got 100, cow, 100 animals like I have, you just roll a bale out and it's gone within two hours. But if you've only got half a dozen cows, it's a bit different. You probably don't need to roll all of it out. I've got some more questions here. I'm just bringing it up to Zoom chat. First of all, I'm sorry that some of you couldn't hear, but maybe that was when David was doing his recording, was it? But hopefully everyone can hear now. Um, picking out on this chat, um, here's a question about um, what are the panel's thoughts of using silage for bell grazing? Can be tricky making good hay, hay here in Fife. I wouldn't no, no. camp silage. What did you say, David? Sorry, I missed that. I wouldn't recommend clump silage. I've fed clump silage 
but it it doesn't the grass doesn't like it that, that it's jumped on but uh, haylage try haylage but if you can get away with it if you can't make hay <coughs> It's, uh, much like it's, it's a cost thing again, isn't it? You know, if we're going to try and try and um, keep the cows as cheaply as we can, hay is a better option. Yeah. With hay, you get the seeding. With silage, you don't get any um, reseeding through it. And of course, you've got to spend all that money on wrapping. And I think I think I can winter a cow on what people just pay on plastic. You know, so. I think I think a lot of contractors can cover so much land now that you know the, the window for haymaking is wider, and um, I, I'm not afraid to sort of knock down 80 acres at a time, and the contractors will cope with it. And round bales do tend to dry out after baling. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with Simon. I would say that you can use silage. I don't think it's can't be done. Haylage is better, definitely. Or anything to the practicality of rolling it out, but yeah, definitely hay is preferable for all the reasons um, Simon stated. In my sheep get silage, um, red clover silage, and of course they're outwintered as well. I know it's not as staggering as outwintering cattle, but but even so, just with a bit of red clover silage, the 350 ewes, that's all the feed they get and need. They they eat about 30 bales. Of silage a year and that's all they want yeah i would just say that we tried feeding haylage one year and the problem with that is that you don't get the seeding benefit because the hay yeah. the seeds have died in the um haylage so if you actually want to get the extra seed benefit um then you, you have to um you have to use hay um, there's a few questions here. Another one. Um, could each of you please um, talk about how you manage your watering points? Well, I'm just the same. They, 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 they wander off down to the river. So but I don't, you, I don't, yeah. But do you have cells though, Simon? If you have cells, if you've got them in cells? Or... No, no, I just move a front fence and then they, they have total freedom behind it. All right. So, um, no, yeah, I just keep moving the fence forward to the new clean bales and clean grass, and then they've got they can do whatever they like. So, so if it's a nasty day, they can go and find a sheltered place, or they can go back down, drink from the river, whatever. So that's a really interesting point, Simon. So you're not because some people say that absolutely crucial is the back fence um, to start your resting, presumably. What what are, what's everyone's thoughts about that? Obviously, you don't feel you need to, Simon. Well, it's, it's mud, isn't it? <laughs> you don't have to persuade them not to eat mud. You know, they're always looking for the, to go forward, you know, for the, for the fresh stuff. And so, some cows won't even bother with the hay, they'll go and straight and eat the grass. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember, there's no like what one way to do it. There's a hundred ways to skin a cat and all that. and. You know, this uh, we found a system that works for us. You could do it differently, and you know, with David's uh, uh, approach, you could feed the hay underneath the fence. So you roll out the hay, you put the fence line down the middle of the swath, and then you move that back. And that there, that way, you'll utilize the feed much, much better, and you won't waste as much. But then you've got to be able to move the bales potentially. You know, uh, you could move to a more intensive uh, bale pod system, similar to what Rob does. Um, and yeah, you put your bales on their end and they pull it down and, you know, you put 100 bales within sort of five acres and it's more of a sacrifice paddock. But then there'll be a huge amount of organic matter laid down, a lot of seed and that paddock will take a lot longer to recover. But if any of you follow him on Twitter, Rob, that is his sacrifice paddock from last year by August this year, it looked pretty phenomenal, the species and the vetches that had come through. So there's lots of different ways of doing it. And that's why I strongly recommend just trialing it and seeing what works. And by trialing, you'll build your confidence that it does work. And that might, you know, uh, help you make the decision investing in infrastructure that maybe you're missing. David and Humphrey, you might just both comment on how you manage your watering systems. Yeah, well, I, I'm very similar to Humphrey, really. I mean, I, I've got because I've got my farm split into lanes, the fields are split into lanes, semi-permanent lanes, 
in every other lane, there is a hydrant every 150 metres, basically. And last year, I, I added four roads up to come off mains because the water bill was getting horrendous. Uh, and yeah, mm. but they're underground. I mean, if you've got a short length of hose, then it's not such a disaster when it's frosty because there is nothing worse than 300 metres of frozen water pipe. Yeah, and we had that last year. So we we had a, a mains water supply, not great pressure. And in the valley that the park is in, it's an 80 metre difference between the bottom of the valley to the top. So therefore, it was impossible for us to get water to the top cell in the valley. So they're always having to run back to water. And there was a lot of overland pipe. And we didn't have a very cold winter. We had a lot of rain, but it was only a few frosty mornings. So that was our big shortfall. And actually, as a grazing block in the growing season, it needed um, a new water system, really, to be able to properly mob graze it. And by having that flexibility to be able to get a good flow rate, 30 litres per minute to every square metre of that uh, piece of land, you know, we're able to target, a bit like David, target those um, shallower soils, you know, on the ridge line where from the ploughing and the maize and all the yeah. hops are washed away, we can, we can put uh, bales more tightly there, get more animal impact, huge amount of dung displaced. Um, and we're able to do that by getting water to them. Um, just again pick up on some of these um, Andy Aldridge has got a point he wants to make about outwintering silage which um, Andy I invite you to do that in just one second um, two comments from Tom Chapman one about rolling which is he can't see uh, the point of using a roller why add further compaction and the other is actually something I love looking noticing here is that when you do use a back fence even in midwinter you can see the grass coming starting to come back behind it and that's a really for me, that's a really satisfying thing to um, be set, be seeing. Um, so, Andy, would you like to make your point about outwintering with silage? Yeah, yeah, thanks, uh, Adelty. Um, yeah, we run um, original population Lincoln Reds here in the Lincolnshire Wolds. So we're fortunate that we've got some slopes. So some of our fields will take silage out, which is round baled and wrapped and we'll take the wrap off pull the net off and then pop it over the fence and it will naturally roll down the slopes so it'll spread it'll spread the silage out um, on the other fields where we can't do that we actually put um, round bales out on a, on their end so they they look they look like a, I don't know um, a, a, on the ends and like in the cone and so what we then do is just go around the bottom with our trusty knife, as Simon's wow. indicated, just take the wrap off, which is easier, and obviously the net, and then let them basically graze or, and chew away at the silage. And then once, once that area is cleared, um, we'll then go back and just put, pick the bottom disc up of the wrap. And we tend to space them out. We don't back fence. We just run them forward and forward and forward until the end of the field. Um, so that's our system and it works. Um, we don't put bales, as Simon said, we don't put bales in the same place um, uh, in, in the following years. Um, but yeah, we feed silage. We don't feed haylage at all. Um, and our grass seems to like silage. So maybe it's maybe different up here, but we've got some wet areas and the trick is to get the bales put out in the summer when the ground is good. Um, and if this year has been a bit tricky because we've been caught out a couple of times um, with a board breakdown on a forklift. Um, but yeah, saying that it works. And um, so I, th I think what I've picked up is, as um, one of the other speakers said, you know, there are various ways to skin a cat. And I think you just got to find the, something that works for you, both for the land, for your stock, and also for the machinery that you've got. Um, yeah, I think water's a challenge. If you've got the infrastructure, it's easy, but without the infrastructure, and that's most probably where you need to invest the time early on, because um, otherwise you spend a lot of time ferrying water. And we, 
when we first set out, we were we were moving IBCs on tracks to get to water troughs, and we very soon learned that that wasn't really a way to work in the in the winter. So mm. hopefully that'll help. I don't know, but yeah, Andy. So, so did you say, if I understood it right, when you you, you open your silage bales out, you didn't roll them out; you just left them in one place. Did did you get poaching around that spot where they were all eating? You get it? a bit. You get a bit, but if you've got enough. If you've got enough grass and silage, um, they tend to they'll they'll pick and mix. Some of them, some of the cows and well, all of our stock, every every single beast on our farm is outwintered. We don't even put them in sheds. So that's that's youngsters, and we finish our beasts up to forty months. So um, yeah, that's what they get used to, and. You get a little bit of poaching, but I'm also, I'm a little bit maybe controversial here, but I think poaching's quite good um, to a degree. And the reason is it breaks the soil up a bit. Um, it increases the surface area, which most people don't realize. And it actually aerates the soil. And I tend to find that actually if you, the key is rest, but if you give it enough rest, I actually see better grass growth in, in areas that were poached than areas that haven't been. Mm. But, you know, maybe that's a bit controversial, but, you know, we don't go that, we don't delivery set out to poach. But what I'm saying is some of the areas that we get poached, you know, we're not saying absolutely trashed, but when they are poached, it seems to come back stronger. And I think sometimes you need to stress it. And if you stress the grass, it tends to, I don't know, it comes back, seems to come back harder. Mm. Interesting. I think David is going to say something on that. We might just pick up comments on that and add in here a question from Matt Swarbick, which is that she's saying, hi, all. we are grazing less cattle in a group such that we take them about four days to eat a round bale. Do you think this could work for us over winter? In summer, we move every day or should they should he keep them moving every day in the winter? Do you have views on both of those points? So poaching and whether you can leave the them in for four days is that me to me anybody who wants to answer yeah andy you why don't you start off have you got a view on uh, that we don't well we we don't really have a mob grass we don't have a mob grazing system we we tend to run in strips so we sort of move them forward in a strip and they might be in there for they might well in the winter they'll be in there for at least a week but all right it's a reasonable area but we've got reasonably small groups so we're not running, say, 40 or 50 cows in a block. Um, and we just move them, move them, you know, move them up as and when they finish, finish the bale. And yeah, and some of the areas are heavily dunged. Um, but the grass, you know, the key is, is once they've gone over it and they've got to the end of the field, you take them out and you put them into the next field and they don't go back into. We most probably graze our fields maybe twice a year. That'll be it. Um, you know, if, this, if you like the same patch of grass twice a year, if that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we've got some land that we we left this year, um, but they'll be go they'll be going on it most probably about February time. So I think we we have this. It's less is more. Um, we're most probably a little bit different to a lot of people is because we have an on-farm on butchery. And so we can control, we can, tr we control the price that the farm gets paid for the beasts. And we pay a, a high price. The farm gets a good price compared to what it would do in the marketplace. So we don't need to run as much stock, but that's because we adopted a vertically integrated business model. So, yeah. Um, anyway, I don't know whether that helps people, but, but yeah. If I, I could say on the smaller things, what I would do is just put a round feed around it. I mean, there are going to be so many benefits from trying it out. Um, well, if they don't eat the bale quickly, you know, you don't want them lying in it and wasting it. So just put a round feed around it and um, you'll get a little bit of treading around it. But the benefits financially and environmentally and everything far outweigh that bit of treading. Mm. And then you can have a ring feeder on the farm. Sorry? I wouldn't have a ring feeder on the farm now. No. I really wouldn't. 
Well, no, would I, but you know, I, I've got enough cattle to eat it. What I can, if I have a few, I think that's what I would do. Mm. Yeah, and I think uh, David uh, stepped on it earlier, getting that balance between um, hay and grass within a cell. And you, you don't, it's fine to have some left behind because, yeah, that will add to organic matter. But I try and um, aim for no more than sort of two inches of material because anything more than that, then it can condense and make the soil anaerobic underneath it and then bacterial dominant. And then you'll get your thistles and your docks coming through. But anything less than that will just be broken down. It will stay aerobic underneath it and it will feed the soil biology. I, I should have got a picture of it, but the first cell we put the cows into uh, this autumn in beginning of October, and I think it was TB testing. So I brought them out back for TB testing and left too much, more than I'd like. But because it was early, we've had a mild autumn until now. Um, actually, it's greened up and already clovers and grasses are coming up through through the thatch. And that's just going to keep the soil really warm underneath. And as Simon says, that'll probably be the greenest part in the spring because it will kickstart much earlier than the more exposed areas. But mm. there's sort of a balance between waste and there definitely can be too much waste, but it's more than you probably think. It's also going back to my TMR days with the dairy cows. I used the hay to balance the grass. I have an awful lot of clover in some fields, which levels of clover, 40, 50% clover. Uh, when I was there and I would have a night, I, would, I, I wouldn't sleep at night with that level of clover in some of my swords. So I, I, I used the hay as a, a balancing act. So you, you, you give them the, the hay sort of Balances out the protein and lack of fibre in the in the clover. Do you? I don't think any of you have answered the business about whether you have uh, would be happy with four day cells um, over the winter. David, would you be happy with four days? No, 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 not the animal density as well. You know. Yeah. No, but this is on a on a low. This is on a on a, a very low number of cattle, um, taking four days to eat a round bale, isn't it? So yeah. the last thing we want is a pile of a four-day-old hay, sort of two foot deep, left behind. So, well, Tom's just said he rolls he rolls it out yeah. and moves the fence along the roll. You know, you can do it. But you, you've got to you've got to start and have a go at these things and work out what what suits your farm, isn't it? You know. That's right. And yeah. So the last thing you want is a is a two foot. You know, it's, it's a quarter of a round bale just sitting in a pile. That'll be there for ages. Mm. There's another good question here about condition of the cattle. Do you have any condition loss on the cows over winter, or are they gaining condition during that time? Well, they'd be losing losing condition, especially with calves on them, and, and that's healthy. It means they get back in calf better. They're in better condition for calving, not too fat. It's just a natural way of of doing things. Mm. You know, uh, they, they they could lose. 50, 60 kilos, easily, easily. Uh, Penny's asked me a, a private question, which is fine to air on here, which she says the countryside stewardship doesn't allow supplementary feeding. So we've not gone into the scheme for this reason. How do you get around this? So I said right at the beginning that we'd used um, FG4, which is an electric fencing payment to get into areas that we wouldn't really otherwise dream of right up on the hill and I think the answer Penny is that you get that payment in order to fence off areas so we're not grazing the fenced off areas we're grazing the other side of it so we're using electric fencing to fulfill the countryside stewardship scheme which is to allow scrub behind the electric fence but we're actually grazing up to that fence it's not included in that particular um, part of the scheme. So I was given derogations to do what I've been doing. And, and if you build up a good relationship with your stewardship officer, you know, you can, although anything's possible, really, you just get his agreement, make your point. And if nature's going to um, get better, you know, they're all for it. So I think their thinking has generally changed for the better, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we certainly have a very good relationship with our Natural England officer who's very up for and also likes the idea that we're trying out new things and happy to sort of feedback. The, they generally seem to have got a fairly positive idea 
to, to, uh, to these sorts of approaches. Has anyone else out there got any experience of natural England over this sort of approach to grazing? Rob Havard is natural England, isn't he? <laughs> um, yeah. There's another question here about um, cell sizes. Niels is asking David the size of his cells and the currency of his moves. That might have been when some of you lot hadn't got any sound, and I'm really sorry about that. David, do you want to just reiterate again how you know the size of your cells, or anyway, how closely packed your cattle are, and how often you might sometimes move them? Yes. Well, at present, I'm just moving them twice, twice a day generally. But now I've, I've got a pasture crop and. It is very wet. I'm trying to light graze it, so I'm moving them four times, I'm moving off the pasture crop at night and onto a crop. But generally, I've got about 100 animals, and they get an acre a day, split up into four or five cells in summer. This time of the year, you split up into two. So, you know, they're quite tightly packed. Um, but there's long rest periods. The return time, when the graze like that is probably 100 days, probably 120 days I've been grazing up till recently. Um, there's another point here made about the question about condition of cattle and uh, Glenn Boyd asking whether you think you have compensatory growth in the spring on the calves when they go onto fresh grass. Huge, huge. Well, they've always got fresh grass, but the compensatory growth is huge. And it's something we must scientifically measure at some stage. Yeah. I, I pre feed my calves. They escape from the wire and pick the best grass. <laughs> has anyone else out there got any questions they want to ask or just any points? Ah, oh, Niels has got another one. Niels, I don't quite understand your point here, an acre a day now. Well, I think what David said earlier is you've got to be totally flexible every morning. Yeah. You've got to look at the weather, you've got to look at your cattle, you look at your hay stocks, and you make decisions on the hoof for a, sorry for the pun. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd also say the, pre the preparation is absolutely key. Like, trial it, but to get it right, like last year we trialled it, and I was still, you know, it started raining the end of August, didn't stop. I thought I'd put them out the first week of September. But if you're trying to put bales out when it's wet, you're going to make a mess. If you get them out in July, August, it's a dream. But yeah, ha sort of think ahead, graze your, you know, in the valley, we graze the bottom cells of the valley first, because obviously they're going to be the wetter in the January, then higher up the topography later on in the season when it's going to be really wet. You know, have a plan B for if it's going to be really, really cold, freezing points, water, the preparation is is the key element, I think. Yeah, I think yeah. one thing I like to say is the the bigger the bigger herds. I think it's worthwhile you're thinking about having maybe two or three corrals on the farm, particularly place, because when it comes really wet, your bottle you lose your bottle. Say, well, we've got it out here. You've got to bring them off the pasture. You throw them onto a corral, a deep wood chip corral. For a couple of days until it stops raining again. Leave them there. I mean, that, that's what people people tend to do in New Zealand, especially in South Um Like I say, I started off on a wood chip corral, yeah. but it, they're so expensive now. Wood chip for biomass for the feeding tariffs for chicken houses is ninety pounds a ton. Oh, that's an understatement. So that? they're just so they're just they're just chipping up timber now yeah. to make for the feeding tariffs. So, yeah, they are. You, you've got to have a bigger wood chip in a corral, but it it did work. I wouldn't, you know, but they're just not cost effective anymore. Mm. Um, there's another question here, guys, about um, spreading weed and thistle seeds through the hay. Do you have any comment to make about that? The, the first question, actually, which I missed, was um, specifically on spreading thistles through your hay, but just just weeds in general. Maybe you'd like to comment on on that and introducing them through um, bales. If you've got your land succession right, seeds don't cut, uh, thistles, and, thistles and weed seeds don't come. They just don't. 
I had a, I think you were keen for that, about five, six years ago, I had a HDB meeting, and I think you left early, and we walked through the fields, and at that point in time, there was thistles everywhere, absolutely everywhere, three foot high. There's none now. Mm. Yeah, I think that's right. And, you the know, land the is in the right mode of succession. Yeah, I'd agree with David. And, you know, the weeds you're getting is a, a symptom of the soil condition. You know, we've got a classic example. We've got this beautiful triple SI meadow. And then by you know, the river we've got, which is, uh, again, a field that was trashed through maize production and irrigation. And it's predominantly ryegrass with creeping thistle. And I mean, millions of them. And they flower and they blow over the river tens of millions, hundreds of millions of seeds. And there's not a single thistle in that side meadow because it can't germinate, you know, it's a healthy sward, the succession's in line. And, you know, there, there's no bare soil for it to land and germinate. However, I think you go on the side of caution, not knowing what paddocks, what paddocks you've got. Uh, if you've got, a, you know, pretty basic permanent pasture and you're spreading loads of thistle seeds, from your hay that's probably not advisable to start with but yeah if you've got good succession in your soil it shouldn't be a problem mm. well i think we've covered all the questions um so unless anybody has got any last last final question pop it on the mat on the um chat or put your hand up or just speak out uh, it just leaves me really to thank um, Humphrey, Simon and David very much indeed for um, their presentations and for answering all the questions tonight. It's been really another really interesting evening with lots of food for thought and ideas and just real experience to build into all of our decision making as we go forward. So thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of your evening. So it was just that question on shelter came in, was it? Um, oh, I didn't see a shelter question. Um, it was, it just popped up. Oh, right, a last one, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. let's have an answer to that. Yes, that's a good well, question. No, it was one point, I've seen we've been doing it 18 seasons now. My cows have put up with every, it's not just wet winters, they've had frozen solid winters, they've had snowy winters, and whatever the weather has thrown at them, they, they've got through it without blinking an eye. So it, you've even had them snow falling on their backs and it doesn't even melt. You know, they're so they're so made, native breed cattle so made to survive. Um, it's a doddle. But I do think that I, I could see, a, a, of course I'm a tenant, that's why I can't spend much money on great infrastructure. But I think if I owned a farm, I would have little blocks of woodland with a water tank in the middle so they got shelter and the outwintering on the grass surrounding it. I think that would be a really neat system. Humphrey, what do you do about shelter and, and David? What do you feel about shelter? Yeah, so I think it de yeah, depends on your situation. We've got that valley, which is possibly a little bit sheltered from the, the woodland on top of the hill. But yeah, we've also got, you know, Solaire and Angus cattle, really good thick coats. Um, keep warm. They huddle together. We're planting more and more trees. Trees would be the ideal and hedgerows. But also, you know, the more you do it, you know, you're going to get that epigenetic benefit um, that's passed down through the generations. But yeah, if you put a, I don't know, 130 kilo Holstein dairy calf out, then it's, you know, it might not be up to it if it rains and snows all winter. So yeah, your genetics got to fit your system, obviously. But I think it's, remarkable how much cattle can withstand to a limit you know mm. i agree with that yeah if, you, if you've got a, a mixed sort of farm with with these shelter belts around you can you can work towards them you, once again you've got to keep your eye on everything you keep your eye on the weather and if it looks like it's going to be really nasty when you get them in where, where there's some trees you know, you know that's what you're worried about but the most important thing the most important thing is to keep that room in flow. You'll cope with a lot. 
Mm. Uh, there are a couple more questions that come in that I've, uh, again, um, when you guys wean, do you house the weaned calves or do you bale graze them too? And have you had any issue with grass rotting underneath your covers? Yeah, so we, we wean, we've left it later. We'd normally wean in November, but we wean now in January with easy weaning and we will bring them in um, onto silage, but that's a system that we're hoping to move away from and probably fence line wean and yeah, wean them onto bale grazing in a separate block. Um, so yes, that's what we do. In terms of the rotting grass, that is that is a thing to a point, you know, your opening cover or your cover going into winter if you don't graze that often by February, that will have slightly reduced because it, the wet, because of our climate often will rot in the base a little bit, but we've done forage analysis in February on some, what looks like some really rough pasture. And we still have like 12 MA energy. So, um, and the grass in our climate, at least in Oxford, doesn't really stop growing unless you have a really cold winter. It's still not that cold in this part of the world and you will still be getting single digit grass growth potentially, hence why it can green up behind your back fence. So in one of my, my photos was the field that hasn't been grazed for a whole year and it still looks green as green. So, so the early grass in the spring has rotted off and gone back into the soil and new grass has grown, you know, in the late summer and, and it's fine. And um, I wean my spring born calves into sheds on silage but the autumn you know the, the august september born calves could stay out all year they say you know they're the ones that really have compensatory growth in the spring and, and sometimes you feel sorry for them they've got great thick tails you know and they're only three or four months old getting through the winter but you never ever lose one and boy do they ever grow and catch up mm. Mm. as cheap as cheap as cheap yeah yeah, Andy's here saying he has a 12-month carving window and he weans outside. Um, yeah. We do as well, in fact. We wean, our calves never come in. Well, they, they come in actually just to be weaned. We put them in a barn and put them in a shed right next door with, with barriers just to wean them away. And then they go back out again. So they they spend their whole lives out. So whereas the cows come in. Cows don't come in at all. Not at all. They've never been in a barn since we've been here five years, ever. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, and the, um, the, we'll split them. We, we, obviously, we take the we, weaned calves off and we put them in because we've got a 12 month window. We've got a bunch, maybe four or five youngsters, and then we'll take the weaned calf and put them in with them. And then as those get a bit older, we'll then take the older ones out and move them to the other ones in another paddock. And um, yeah, it, it the, the the usual thing is the cow sometimes jumps the fence going looking for the calf but yeah. with my electric fences but yeah it it works and um i think it i think the calf is a lot stronger if it stays outside it um and because we've got lincoln's there they're a long-haired calf the cow so in the winter their coats they're prepared for the winter and touch wood uh, we've never had an issue with in fact, we haven't had the vet, this would be a kiss of death, won't it? We haven't had the vet out in five years for any of our cows or calves. Mm. Not even for breach. We, we, we haven't had breaches or anything. We've been lucky, but for, for illness and pneumonia or anything, we have nothing. We don't, very rarely do you sit here a cow calf, a cough. So... I'm a firm believer, keep them outside. That's what they were designed to do. They were designed to stay outside. We've most probably modicoddled them. And um, and the problem is with, if you've got long haired cattle, they sweat um, inside. And it's the most unhealthiest thing I think you can, um, you can do to them. Very That's good. a very good note to finish on. Keep your cattle outside. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I'd just like to thank you all. It's seven o'clock now. It's time to finish. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining in and um, making all the comments and things. And look forward to the next time. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.